All of these giant constrictor snakes that we're talking about, to be clear, these are non-native animals. And I've been reading, you know, for years, the theories on how these large snakes came to inhabit South Florida. And I, I talked to you briefly on the phone about this, but for our audience, I will apprise them. One of the theories was that in 1992, when they had Hurricane Andrew, that it, uh, you know, it, it destroyed pet stores, and I guess some of these animals got loose. The other idea is, and I find this probably valid, is that people let loose voluntarily these animals whom they can no longer um, take care of. But you brought up another option which kind of blew me away and I was not anticipating. Do you remember what that was, what you told me about how they might get out there? Yeah, people who release them purposefully so that they can find them in the wild. I mean, people people do strange things, things that are wildly inappropriate in, in retrospect that may seem like a good idea at the time. We have pigeons that are established here, starlings, uh, English house sparrows, and a few other birds that were released on purpose. Uh, we have wild pigs that were brought here on purpose for food, and now they they you know they run they run around wild pretty much pretty much everywhere. Well, so. That's a potential vector for those animals to get here, and it could be any number of contributors. There may not be one reason why they're here. There may be uh, multiple reasons or maybe multiple causes for their population to become established. But the bottom line is they're not native to Florida, and they have no natural predators. They don't have natural predators, but they do have predators. I mean, and that's one thing that we're never going to be able to extract from the information we find out about them. Because we're not going to go around and harvest birds and find out what's in their guts or harvest uh, cats or, or, you know, uh, bobcats or cougars or panthers, rather, uh, or alligators and find out how many pythons they've eaten. That is going to be kind of a serendipitous event where somebody documents it photographically, a, a, a wading bird eating a small python or an owl or a hawk. So those are things we don't know. We do not know the mortality from hatch to uh, adulthood. So we don't know how many of those animals survive. And the reason they produce large numbers of young at high fecundity is usually associated with animals that are, don't all make it. Mm -hmm. Rabbits do the same thing. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of reptiles produce lots of young because there's no parental care. The animals disperse from a nest and, and then they're on their own pretty much from the beginning. Another thing I found interesting is that uh, pythons, I guess, primarily lay eggs where anacondas give birth to, to live young. Is that correct? Yeah, anacondas are, are related to boa constrictors. Boa constrictors are live bearers. Pythons are, are egg layers. But they do, uh, the, the female will sit on the nest and she will help uh, keep the temperature of the nest stable. They even uh, do some muscle twitches to keep the temperature uh, uh, right and then they go out and they bask and then they come back and sit on the nest. So the nests aren't really exposed to predators unless something happens to the mother while she's sitting on it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not too many animals that are going to come up and, and uh, get into a nest with a, you know, a, a large python, a 10 or 10 foot or bigger python sitting on it. I can, yeah, I can't imagine that. Um, when they are guarding their nest, how long does it take from the birthing the eggs to the, the eggs hatching? We're probably around 60 days or so, and, okay. and here in late spring, we see the egg deposition. Uh, you know, breeding occurs uh, for early in spring. A little bit later in spring, we, we see egg deposition, and then early summer hatch, hatching. During the time those, period... The average size of those uh, nests is about 30, mid-30s, uh, although they can have m many more than that. And then I think the largest uh, number, the most eggs that they found in one was in the 80s. And they can have uh, two litters of offspring a year? Usually they're doing it every two years. Usually these okay. animals are producing every two years. These are wild animals, not captive animals. Uh, so they actually have to work for their food, and they tend to be a little less, uh, a little less rotund than, than captive animals. Captive uh, animals have lots of fat reserves. These animals are healthy. The animals we find here are healthy. They are, they're doing quite well uh, because they don't need to eat a lot. You know, that, that's one of the things that helps them survive is they don't need to eat every day. So they're not actively searching for food. They may sit in an area for, uh, you know, a month and a half, two months until they get a prey item. And if they catch a big prey item, like a, a one eight, an 80 or so pound deer, it may not eat for another six months, maybe a little bit more. And it'll be fine. What is the biggest uh, python that you've encountered so far in your work? The biggest I've found at work is 14 feet. The biggest that's been caught in Florida is around 18 feet, 8 inches. And what would be the weight on a snake like that? 
the the larger snake was really only around 120 pounds that didn't have anything in its gut contents uh and you know so their their weight varies if they have a meal and if you eat 80 pounds and you weigh 100 you're gonna you're gonna weigh close to 200 pounds with that meal while you digest it until you defecate and that animal had nothing no gut contents whatsoever i think there was a, like a feather in there and uh you know, but it was doing well. It was finding plenty of food. It was healthy, uh, but thin. You know, 120 pounds.